introduce myself. My name is Cassio Silva. I am a uh, fly fishing guide for all water guides based out of Austin. You probably know Alvin and Lene who run the show. Um, I'm fortunate enough to uh, get to fish a lot of the local waters around here in Texas, uh, predominantly around the hill country area. So we fish a lot of the Colorado River, the Guadalupe, the Llano, um, the San Marcos River. And so within that area falls the range of the Guadalupe bass. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, really quick show of hands. Who was here for the Rio Grande cichlid talk earlier with Chris? Very cool. I'm really glad that we kind of, that he did that talk um, just because, you know, these wild native Texan species should be something that we all get to know a little bit better. And we're going to touch on why it's so important that we know those species and why it's so important to conservation, why it's so important to the angling community and the future of angling and access for our rivers um, here in Texas. So without further ado, let's get started on talking a little bit about Guadalupe bass. So unlike the Guadalupe bass, I am not a Texas native. I was born in Brazil far, far away from Texas. There's one other Brazilian in the house. All right, we represent. And so um, coming to Texas, you know, a lot of us really trying to figure out like, what's this place all about? You know, what are this, you know, what's the things you can do here outside? What are the, the wild, you know, places that you can visit? And that slowly starts getting you down the road of chasing fish like this. So let's talk a little bit about the Guadalupe bass today. So guys, the Guadalupe bass, is the state fish of Texas. Just like the blue bonnet is our state flower, that is our state fish. Now, really cool story on that. It was actually a group of third graders in 1989 that took a liking to this weird, rare fish they found out was only found in Texas, and they wrote their congressman, and the congressman said, that's a good idea, we should have a state fish. And the Guadalupe bass became the official state fish in 1989, and I got free stuff over here, so who can tell me what is the state saltwater fish? Show hands. Redfish, Redfish. all right. <laughs> you ready to catch? It's kind of heavy, here you go. Oh, you got something in your hand, here you go. Bam, there you go. You gotta give away the good prizes first, everyone's like, I wanna get involved now. Ah, there's cool stuff to win. Okay, so guys, it's our state fish. now. We're going to talk a little bit about why it makes it our state fish because there's a lot of other states out there that have state fishes that are the same as other states. And I think that's totally lame because like how are you going to share a state fish? Well, our state fish, not only is it only Texas that the Guadalupe bass is a state fish for, this is the only place you can find them, which makes them extra special. So the Guadalupe bass reaches maturity at about one years old. And that's about a 12 inch fish, okay? Their lifespan is not very long. Five, six years is about their total lifespan. And the reason why that's important is because in Texas, we deal with a lot of droughts. So you probably, you know, if you guys live here, you all heard about all the flooding and then the droughts that the Lano had and all of a sudden the fishing was horrible there. A Couple of years later, guess what? It's fishing great again, why? because the native fish of Texas adapted to deal with these droughts and when they have the opportunity to grow and breed, they grow and breed quickly and they don't live very long. So if you're catching a bigger Guadalupe bass, it's only a few years old, but a one-year-old fish at about 12 inches is a mature adult, okay? And that's really important to kind of keep in mind because I always talk to people that fishing is relative. The same person that chases, you know, that giant fish of a lifetime probably gone out and chased little brookies and gone, man, this is really cool. You gotta think of fish as individuals. When you catch a big, beautiful sunfish, you don't go, well, that's a little fish. You go, that's a really big sunfish. Well, same thing, being aware that a Guadalupe bass is a full breeding adult at 12 inches in about a year, when you catch those small ones, you're catching an adult fish. So. The state record, the biggest one really ever caught was a little over 17 inches. Now there's two, there's one that was caught on Lake Travis and this 3.7 pound one that was caught on the Colorado River just a few miles away from here. This was caught by Dr. Townsend um, and Shea McCallahan and this fish at 3.7 pounds is the biggest recorded 
Guadalupe bass caught. Now, the story kind of goes, they actually caught this fish like first thing in the morning. By the way, why is it so big? Because they were fishing during the winter time. Look at those jackets. All you guys are really excited about trout season right now. That's awesome. But we can still go bass fishing. They eat 12 months out of the year. And here in Texas, since it doesn't get that cold, our fish have evolved to be active year round. They don't hibernate like those big, late, large mouths in other places. They're active year round. So I think just a week ago, you know, we went out and caught a ton, you know, about a week ago while it was cold. But this fish was caught in early spring while it was still cold. They pack on a bunch of weight, and right before spawning, they're at the heaviest they're gonna be. So if you wanna chase some big bass and possibly a, a record-sized fish, you gotta do it during the winter time when nobody else is fishing. We're down there with sinking lines, dredging crawfish, and this one here was actually caught in a little goldy crawfish at the very bottom. And they caught it, I think within the very few minutes of the trip, which meant they had a decision to be made. What do we do with this record fish? And we can't, like if we keep going on the trip, we gotta release it, and then if we think it's a record, we gotta do something about it. So Shay had someone come down with a cooler aerator. They got it to a weigh station, officially was recorded as the biggest one, you know, court, caught and recorded in Texas. And then I believe it spent some time in uh, Buda at the Cabela's uh, Aquarium. It was there for a while. They used this fish part of the Lunker program to breed more Guadalupe bass. Now, anyone know where this fish might have ended up? I might not even be alive by now. Anyone, is it still in the tank? Museum. Museum somewhere? If someone had... He lived out the rest of his life at the fishery center in Athens. Very. And then was... All day, just <laughs> petted. That makes sense. Yeah, I was say, this fish is probably gone, but... It had a good life, and the reason why Guadalupe bass are in a lot of places now was because of this fish. But guys, that is the state record. This is typically what we're chasing, okay? Like, this is a Guadalupe bass you're typically catching. And once again, it's all relative. You catch a really big brookie somewhere, you go, wow, that's a huge brookie. We're talking Guadalupe bass. They're not largemouth. They're not going to get to 10 pounds. So being aware of what you're catching, realizing what you caught is a big deal because I'm sure there's a lot of Texans that would have caught this fish and go, eh, that's, that's a decent largemouth, and then thrown it back, not knowing they caught the state record fish that would have changed the entire genetics of the state because they didn't know what it was. However, we're catching these little guys. So why is this so important? Why are we chasing these little tiny fish? Well, they're endemic to Texas, meaning they're only found here. They're found in the northern and eastern part of the Edwards Plateau, which in Texans term, it's in the hill country. So these fish are found in the hill country and they're native to only a few watersheds, which includes the upper Guadalupe River, you know, parts, you know, the San Marcos, you find them, you find them in the Llano, you find them in the San Antonio River, actually in San Antonio we got them, and you know, upper Colorado River and even down past the dam you get them. Now, you can catch them outside of those areas, but we're gonna talk a little bit of why that starts getting into some issues. But if you're catching them in the hill country, you're probably catching a Guadalupe bass. Now, why is this important? Why are these little guys so important? Why do we care about little fish? Why don't we just stock a bunch of smallmouth? Why don't we get some big fish in there? And here's the thing that I always told people. The wild native fish are the true test of how your native resource is doing. You can bring in and stock all the fish you want, and have a fishery and have people catching fish, but if the wild native fish can no longer make, make it where it was supposed to be, then we created a problem. So as we start losing Guadalupe bass, that's when we start asking questions like, what's going on with the hill country? What's going on with the water in the hill country? What's going on with the pressure on these fish that, that we might be losing them? They're actually doing really well right now, and so that means that we're doing a good job. So, the native fish, the Rio Grande cichlids, the Guadalupe bass, and many other species, to me, become the test of how we're doing as far as taking care of these wild places. So these Guadalupe bass become very special to us, especially to people that really like to chase them, because since they live in the hill country, they live where the water needs to be pristine, needs to be clean, for us as fly anglers, that means that we get to chase these fish in some of the most beautiful places in Texas. They're up there in the headwaters of the hill country. We're gonna find them on the Llano River. 
you know, great population of Guadalupe bass in the Llano River. They've done restockings to bring them back. Um, you find them in the upper Guadalupe River. Once again, just these most beautiful parts of Texas is where these Guadalupe River, or sorry, these Guadalupe bass live. You know, the San Marcos River, if you fish with me on the San Marcos River, you've probably gone down these routes. And so we're talking about these fish truly live in the most beautiful places in Texas. And as long as they're happy, that means that we're taking care of those really beautiful places in Texas. So one thing that we're always going to get into when we start talking about Guadalupe bass is being able to truly identify them. Now, I hope not to hurt some people's feelings about the really big Guadalupe bass you caught this year or last year, and I might end up telling you it's not a Guadalupe bass. So the best way to figure out if it's a Guadalupe bass is better understanding what else could it be that I'm catching. So first and foremost, you have the largemouth bass or your black bass or Florida bass. These are pretty much found at this point in just about every state in the United States, you can find largemouth bass. There's a good chance if you're catching bass somewhere, you're probably catching largemouth bass. They do better than just about any other species, and so they're pretty widespread. Now, if you catch a largemouth bass, the easiest way to identify them is they have a large mouth, okay? So does this have the little, oh man. I said one of these when I was a teacher, and this is the favorite part. So if, when I say a large mouth, how they identify these fish, and you kind of read up on the identifications on them, they're gonna talk about the, edge of the back of their eye. So if you think about the back of their eye, if their mouth goes past the back of their eye, it's a largemouth bass. And that's it. There's no, nothing else is going to be. If it's a bass and its mouth is bigger past the eye, you have a largemouth bass. That's the end of it. Be excited about it. Also, if it's several pounds, it's probably a largemouth bass, okay, especially here in Texas. So when you're catching these fish, there's all these other things that identify them, but honestly, the easiest way is, is their mouth bigger past their eye? Their colorations are different. And so, and I've heard people talk about the different strains of largemouth. I'm aware there's different ones, but they've all hybridized so much at this point that most people just call them largemouth bass. You're gonna get some that have a solid, just kind of green color and white belly. You get some that have spots on them. I find that here in the hill country, probably due to kind of, you know, survival of the fittest, the ones that are more spotted and camouflage better, like the Guadalupe bass naturally were here doing, um, do really well. So I have a lot of people catch these large mouths and they see all these spots on them and go, oh my God, I just caught the state record. If the mouth is past the eye, you caught a large mouth, which you'd still be happy about. Oh, look at that. Because they're awesome fish. I mean, they're all over the place. So pretty much anywhere you can catch a Guadalupe bass, you can find largemouth too. But you can see this fish here, it's got some cool patterns on him, some you know, little diamond patterns. But ultimately, it's got a big old mouth. It's past the eye. This thing was five pounds, you know? So it's a largemouth, okay? Uh, this is actually a really fun day. It was a brand new beginner client. Uh, done a little bit of fishing at Brushy Creek when fishing on the St. Marcus with me. We threw a little popper all day catching sunfish and then this guy came out of a log and smacked it on a five weight rod and like 10 pound test, so good time. So let's get into the ones that have a smaller mouth, okay? So you know, you hear large mouth and you also hear small mouth bass. In Texas, we do have small mouth bass. In a lot of the places that you find Guadalupe bass, the state has done a good job of actually trying to get rid of the smallmouth bass. Anyone want to tell me why we don't want smallmouth where we have Guadalupe? I got prizes here. Uh, invasive species. Invasive species, but what happens if you have them in the they same place? The What's that? They kill off the population. They kill off the population? They compete. What's they inbreed. So yeah, they kill off the population with hybridization. And so if you have a little double whammy, there we go. So if you have smallmouth in the same stream that you have Guadalupe bass, they compete. So smallmouth bass are going to get bigger. They're more aggressive. They're going to eat a lot of the food, and they're going to take over the space. The biggest problem is, is that they'll start inbreeding, or sorry, not inbreeding, but crossbreeding, and then you have these hybrid 
versions of a Guadalupe smallmouth hybrid. It's really hard to tell you know, how much of what it is unless you do genetic testing. So places that had smallmouth that have Guadalupe, the chances of them being 100% Guadalupe is very low. The places that have 100% Guadalupe now is because pure genetically bred Guadalupe were reintroduced into that area. Hybridization becomes the biggest problem. Do I love small mouths? Yeah. Do I love catching them? Yeah. Do I wish we would stock these instead of trial in the Guadalupe? Yeah. But unfortunately, they're going to hybridize with our, our guads. And so as much as I love small mouths, we don't want them in Texas. Now, as far as identifying a small mouth, because as you can see, they start kind of looking close to a guad, so it becomes a little bit tougher. You know, the small mouths have a obvious small mouth, meaning that usually their mouths are at the front of their eyes, okay? That's one of the easy ways. So now you have a fish that has a small mouth, but it could still be a guad, it could still be a spot, it could be an Alabama bass, a shoal bass. So when we get into the small mouth, the biggest thing for these is two things. The barring, the stripes they have, and the coloration. Now, barring, every fish is a little bit different. You're gonna have fish that have longer barring, smaller barring, but typically small mouth will have longer, almost connected bars down their side. But really the more obvious things about small mouth compared to Guadalupe bass is their color. When you catch a small mouth, they're typically gonna have that bronze color. They're darker looking fish, they don't have that green, they're gonna have more of a bronze, darker color to them. So, since we like seeing big fish, oh, I forget, you know, little digital here, all right. So, this right here was a small mouth. This was caught on the trout section of the Guadalupe. I didn't get a, quite a weight on this fish, but um, that's an 18 inch net, so that fish was like 20, 21 inches or so. Um, so this fish, I was on the trout section, nymphino run, five weight rod, you know, five X tippet, 20, size 20, little midge on the back, little girdle bug in the front. And what I think happened, because I don't want to believe that a fish this big ate a size 20 midge, but it, you know, it could happen. But I think what happened is he ate the girdle bug, you know, it looks like a little, you know, little Dobson fly going through the water, or whatever else. But I saw the, you know, indicator or bobber go down, set the hook, and what splashed at the surface it was definitely not a trout, but I knew something was big. And so we landed this guy on a size 20 midge, like stuck inside his lips. I think he might have eaten the girdle bug and that midge just slid into him. Um, but gorgeous fish, but you can see the dark colors on him the long barring down this fish, obviously the size of it, that's a small mouth. Now small mouth aren't gonna be, you know, they're pretty much at this point a needle in a haystack. I think I caught this one on the, on the Guadalupe. Um, I've caught a few smaller ones on the Guadalupe since then. I caught a decent one on the San Marcos one time, but they're becoming more and more rare. The state's been trying to do a good job of getting rid of these fish. That way our Guadalupe bass can thrive, grow, and take back their original range. All right, this last one is the toughest one. This is where I feel like I'm gonna hurt some people's feelings because I see a lot of people posting photos of Guadalupe bass, and unfortunately they're not giving enough you know, of, of of, of credit for another bass species that we have here is that we have spotted bass. So a lot of people catch these guys and they think they're guads, especially when you're fishing for them outside of that Edwards Plateau. Once you start getting east of 35, down to San Marcos, down to Guadalupe, down to Colorado, you start getting spotted bass, okay? They're very similar looking. They're like the closest cousins here. Now, I was talking to someone about this earlier, is that when we start getting to the small mouth species, you know, you can see it's still in front of the eye, so it's still considered kind of one of the small mouth species. Basically, every state's got their version of it. The large mouth got introduced and got taken everywhere, and large mouth is kind of like brown trout. You know, they came from Germany, now they're everywhere. You know, large mouth bass started kind of in Florida and the Gulf Coast, and now they're everywhere. But the smallmouth species, I always tell people that's, if you like trout fishing, that's really similar to like chasing cutthroat trout. If you drive through the Rockies, every little mountain range got their own specific cutthroat trout. 
And if you stand in certain parts of Colorado, it's really hard to tell if you're catching a greenback cutthroat or a Colorado River cutthroat or a Rio Grande cutthroat. And some of them are so similar looking that, I mean, unless you really check out genetics on them or you know for a fact that this river, there's no other way for these fish to get in. All that's in here is Colorado River cutthroat or whatever. Same thing with our kind of smallmouth species. There's a lot of overlap on these ranges. So when you start kind of leaving the Edwards Plateau and going down the Guadalupe or the San Marcos, you know, you start running into spotted bass. So I see a lot of folks catching these fish and saying they're catching Guadalupe bass. So here's kind of, you know, the big identifiers for them, okay? The biggest thing for me is that they have a distinct 50-50 to their coloration. So even though they're going to have similar kind of spots down that lateral line that's broken up, the guads are going to have a little bit more broken up of a line, but here's the thing, fish are all different. You're going to have some guads that have them closer together. You're going to have some that are very distinct triangles. They can go, oh, that's a guad. But my biggest thing is if I can see a distinct line down the middle where it literally splits it, where here there's pattern, here's white, I'm probably looking at a spotted bass. The other thing too, we're talking about those cutthroat species, is also understanding where you're standing. Are you in the range of the spotted bass? Or are you in the range that should only have Guadalupe bass? But if you're catching these fish and you're looking at a fish that's literally perfectly half and half, you have, probably have a spotted bass. So let me show you a couple of examples here. Um, as you can see, they kind of look really similar. So in these photos here, these are largemouth and spotted bass. So you can see largemouth, you know, kind of green, all little patterns, obviously the big mouth so that gives away, another large mouth there. You know, the patterns are similar, but big mouth, automatically large mouth. Big mouth, automatically large mouth. But here is what I talk about the distinct half and half, okay? So there's a lot of people that will catch a fish that looks like this in a lot of our rivers and go, man, I just caught a two pound quad. You caught an awesome fish, it probably fought super hard, you should be proud of it but it was a spotted bass. And that's okay, be happy about it, but just know what you're catching. So same thing here, here's another spotted bass. Once again, I see a distinct half and half line. You know, that's kind of gives them away. Spotted bass will also get quite a bit bigger in East Texas, where there a lot of people fish for spotted bass in far East Texas there. Um, these fish are five, six pound fish. There's some lakes that hold like nine, 10 plus pound spotted bass. So they will get a lot bigger. Typically in the rivers, they're staying smaller. We catch them in the two pound, three pound range, you know? So they're very close to that size of a Guadalupe bass. But to me, that half and half is really what kind of gives them away. So back to our Guadalupe bass, just make sure we understood the characteristics. We got a mouth that is smaller, or sorry, say in front of the eye. So if it goes back here, automatically large mouth. It is green, it is not copper, it's not bronze, it is a green color. The last and final things is their patterns, which I always tell people, they're the state fish of Texas. So if you catch something that looks like a rattlesnake, it's probably a Guadalupe bass. It has those very distinct diamonds on them. That's what you're probably holding a Guadalupe bass. But along with having those distinct patterns on them, that pattern goes past that halfway point. So if you're catching a little fish and it's got these cool patterns on it, it's got a small mouth, and those patterns go past that halfway point, you're probably holding a true Guadalupe bass. So this right here is one of my best ones on the Colorado River. This fish was just shy of three pounds. Mr. Bonner Arm Brewster rode me into this one. This is actually one of those days that um, People did not want to fish this day. It doesn't look like it, but it was muddy water. And if you've gone to the Colorado River in the last year, it's been muddy water. But I always say that big fish make mistakes in dirty water. It, you know, dirty water days are days that you go out, you know it's going to be a grind. You may not catch a lot of fish, but your chances of fooling a bigger fish in that dirty water, you're more likely. They can't see very well. If you just happen to put that fly in front of a fish that's not trying to move very far to go hunt something, that's when you find them. So this fish here was caught in a big old double black deceiver fly about that size. We, we said, hey, 
We're not going to catch much today. Let's just, you know, swing for the fences. Let's throw the big stuff. And, you know, my personal best Guadalupe bass, just shy of three pounds. Beautiful fish. Once again, it's patterns. You can't see quite well in this bright, but you can see nice diamonds. They go past the halfway point. You see that nice green color all the way down to the belly. Mouth is definitely smaller than the eye. Looks like a Guadalupe bass to me. Guadalupe bass, you agree? Okay, cool. I, you know, the hardest thing about doing a Guadalupe bass presentation is as much as I try to think I know which ones are which, I will still put a photo that someone at the end goes, oh, on slide 17, um, that was actually a hybrid. Um, so that's the Guadalupe bass as far as I'm concerned. But once again, in Texas, hybridization, a DNA test is really the only way to know. So if this fish was four pounds, it probably would have been somewhere getting a DNA test, you know, for a record. But beautiful fish in that two and a half to three pound range, these things are going to fight harder than any large mouth you've ever hooked. So one of the reasons why we love to chase these fish are because for the fly rod enthusiast and the fly angler, these fish look up more often than the large mouth. They eat in shallower areas than a large mouth, and they like eating terrestrials. They like to eat bugs. They do it when they're small, and they do it again when they get big and lazy. So for the fly angler, these are fish that we can target year round on poppers and bugs and all sorts of things. So before we get into how we catch them, oh, here's some more photos, I forgot. I was gonna try to show you guys just the differentiation. So, you know, here you have something to me that is a pure strain looking Guadalupe bass. Diamonds, comes all the way down to the belly. This one here is where we start getting into the, ugh. maybe I can tell when this fish gets a little bigger because he's got the patterns, but it kind of splits. I mean, I'm seeing some green, you know, that was a tough call. I mean, that's a fish that I look at and go, it might be a hybrid, it could be a guad. Maybe when he gets a little bit bigger, we'll really be able to tell a little bit more. You know, a lot of times, you know, people are catching those and they're saying they're Guadalupe bass. That could be a hybrid. That could be, a, you know, a spotted bass. Kind of hard to tell when that coloration is kind of half off there. But that one there, pretty obvious one. Does the eye give it away at all? So you asked me that earlier. You're talking about like the color of the eyes? So, and I would love for someone that knows, I, I read this. So Texas State had an article about Guadalupe bass. And what they brought up on the article, and, and someone heard the same thing, let me know. If you heard something different, let me know. Um, that the red eyes are breeding males. So as males go into spawning, their eyes actually turn red. Now, y'all heard anything about that? Any experts in the room? So I literally, this is something that I've always thought was like a random thing. Some have red eyes, some don't, blah, blah, blah. But I ran across this article from Texas State just a couple of days ago that actually brought that up, that red eyes are breeding males. And it's funny, I've never caught a big one with red eyes, which the big ones are typically females. I've only caught smaller ones with red eyes, which are probably males, so maybe, there's, maybe that's true. Whoever wrote that article probably knows way more than I do about them, so it might be true. But they definitely change in coloration, so it's kind of hard to tell them apart. You know, as we start going around and catching them, you can kind of see the pattern. So here's a photo of two fish caught in the lano. Large mouth, bigger mouth, kind of green, no patterns, and a solid Guadalupe bass. Nice diamond patterns on them. That color goes all the way down to his belly. You know, that's a nice little guad, large mouth. She caught him on the same time. We had a double drop, you know, like two flies running. We caught him at the same time, so that's pretty cool. And then young man here, on the St. Marcus River, we got a large mouth, big mouth there, and that's a spotted to me, you know? So this fish here gets called a Guadalupe bass a lot, you know? But once we start, once again, getting to those ranges where you know you're gonna have both, you're gonna have to pay a little more attention, but that fish to me is probably a spotted, a Guadalupe spotted hybrid, you know? So, but you can definitely see that definite half and half of that fish, okay? So, let's play a game. And I got prizes, so let's do this. All right, here we go. All right. Now, so, I can't just have people shouting out things, okay? I was a teacher, so raise your hand, I'll call it. I'll look for the first hands, okay? So, I'm gonna show you a photo. 
Question is, is it a guad? And if you tell me no, you got to tell me what it is. Okay? All right. Dun, dun, dun. Is it a guad? <laughs> Young man, yellow hat. No. What is it? Large mouth bass. Large mouth bass. Here you go, man. <laughs> there you go. The, 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 the Yeti stuff gets all the hoots and hollers, man. All right. Oh, here you go. That's my beautiful wife, you know? And um, fish love structure. It don't matter what it is, you know? I've, I think this one was a shopping cart that it was inside of, you know? So that one was inside a shopping cart. Young man was right. We got a large mouth here. No, you know, no patterns on them. Big mouth. One thing I didn't bring up earlier, because it's not a definite way to know it's a Guadalupe, but it's definitely a way to know it's a large mouth. Um, if you open up their tongues, which I think it's a really cool evolutionary trait, when you open up the, op open up the mouth of large mouths, their tongue is smooth. You touch their tongue and it's like just smooth. Guadalupe bass, since they're meant to live in rivers where they're catching prey as it's moving by, not just trying to swallow them whole, they actually have a spare tongue patch on their tongue. So if you pet the tongue of a Guadalupe bass, it's gonna feel like a cat's tongue. It's gonna be real rough, and that's to hold on to prey in the current. Now, smallmouth will have that too. Um, the, you know, the spotted bass will have that too. But if you open them up and it's smooth, you probably have a large mouth. If it's got a little rough patch, you got some kind of smallmouth species. So, good, that's a large mouth. So let's go to the next one. Is it a guad? What is it? Uh, small mouth. I'll give you one more chance. <laughs> Large mouth. <laughs> there you go. So it's got the nice green color, not bronze. So it's not a small mouth. Plus, look at the mouth on that thing, man. Big old largemouth bass. But yes, not a guad. Largemouth bass. It's a very exclusive hat, you know? So yes, yeah, yeah. Only people that went to the trash bash. So when you wear it, you know, lie to people. You know, I was there, I helped out, you know? <laughs> All right, let's keep on going, let's play the game. Is it a guad? Yes, it's a guad. It's a guad, how do you know? Because the stripes and the color goes past it. Good, you also notice he's wearing a hat that says yeah. guad, so that's always, <laughs> that's also very helpful there. Uh, I'm not sure how many of y'all follow uh, Mr. Odom Wu on Instagram. Uh, Odom's a good friend of mine, lives in San Antonio. So my buddy Kai, me and him went fishing, and he showed up, and he's like, man, Odom, when he goes carp fishing, he's got a carp hat. When he goes, you know, redfish, he's got a redfish hat. So he went and got his guad hat, and we had a day that day. So there's probably something to it, match the hat to the fish. But yeah, this one's calling the Colorado River, just down Weberville, and you can see, you got that nice color going all the way down his belly. You got some nice diamond patterns, smaller mouth, beautiful fish. That size Guadalupe bass there is a nice, solid, like, you know, bigger adult. I mean, this is a fish that's been around for a while. It's probably bred a couple times. You know, beautiful fish, perfect fins on them. And this will make some such hard fighting fish. They just got these big old paddles on them. Plus they work out all the time. I always tell people, largemouth, they live in ponds and slow water. You hook a largemouth, it's fun for that first blow up. They might give you a jump, but usually they're kind of, you know, you horse them in. These Guadalupe bass, they live in that river. They know where the snags are. They know where that undercut is. And I've hooked some small ones that'll try to sprint right back into spots. And we'll talk a little bit more about catching them. But yeah, that's a Guadalupe bass. Let's go to one last one here. Is it a guad? Oh, what do you want to? That is not a guad. That's not a guad. What is it? That's a small mouth. It's a smallmouth bass. Here we go. And how do we know? How do we know it's a smallmouth? Uh, the color. The color, yeah. Color's a dead giveaway. Mr. Johnny Guetta here. There's Alvin, you know, we had a good time on the Devils, one of the few rivers in Texas where you have a ton of smallmouth bass. And so, smallmouth, this fish, by the way, fish of the trip. I mean, that, this thing right here had fat where other fish don't even have fat anymore. I mean, look at the tail on this thing. I mean, if you ever had a, seen a fish with rolls, I mean, look at this thing. I mean, like, you know, it like, 
you know, and that's what I was just, I, I think I was talking to Matt here about like the size. It's like big wads, they don't go past 16, 17 inches. They just start putting on weight. You know, small mouth too, like 19, 20 inches, about as big as you're going to catch a small mouth. But they'll start putting on weight and talk about hard fighting fish. So small mouth bass, not a Guadalupe bass. So finally, let's talk a little bit about how to catch these guys, okay? So I know a lot of you guys are chasing them. Um, but I'm hopefully going to give you guys a quick little tips on how you guys can be a little bit more successful in chasing Guadalupe bass. Now, as you saw, I showed y'all photos of quite a range of size of fish, okay? And so when it comes to fishing Guadalupe bass, you know, match where you're fishing. If you're fishing the upper stretches of the Guadalupe River where you're in a little creek of, of a river, the fish are small, Bust out that three weight, have some fun. Get that fiberglass rod that you talked yourself into buying this year, you know? Get out there and have a good time. Now, as you start getting into the bigger rivers, you know, then we get it into heavier rods. And all the time people get on my boat and they go, wow, seven weight? Well, when you start throwing heavier flies, you need a rod that can handle it. It has nothing to do with the size of the fish, guys. I'm not fishing a seven weight because we need to fight a fish with a seven weight rod. It comes down to casting a rod. And I personally rather have a rod that can handle it all than have a rod that goes, oh, I wish like, ah, oh, this can't quite throw this big streamer. A big rod would throw the small stuff, but a small rod won't really throw the big stuff very well. Now, if you wanna be somewhere in between, I think a six-way rod for a lot of the bass fishing in Texas will get the job done. It's gonna let you throw some stuff with some lead eyes, a little bit of weight. Um, it'll throw all your streamers and everything else, but three to seven weight, you're gonna be fine. Now. I see a lot of bass stuff being sold, bass rods, and you see a lot of these bass specific rods out there, and a lot of them are gonna be shorter rods. Now, so you don't get confused by that, there are some advantages to a shorter rod. I mean, it's, you get quicker, you know, short casts. You know, if you're gonna be picking up a rod and casting all day, a short rod will make those short casts pretty easier on you. But the reason why a lot of companies sell bass rods actually has to do with competitive bass fishing. There's an eight foot rule to rods you're allowed to have on a competitive bass tournament. So the fly fishing industry kind of followed suit and started making a lot of bass rods that were shorter. So you can fish a nine foot rod all day long, but there are some advantages to a shorter rod when you're fishing the same markets. There's got a lot of heavy cover and you're casting underneath trees all day. If you're floating our rivers in a kayak or something, having a shorter rod keeps everything in the boat a little bit better. But typically a nine foot rod is perfectly fine. If you see shorter rods, has more to do with that eight foot rule. Now, this is where we get into some other things. The leader and the line. Most fly fishing combos out there are sold for trout fishing. And even more so, they're sold for like throwing tiny dry flies, very delicate to flies, which is not what we do for bass fishing. So when we think about bass fishing, guys, we're throwing heavy lines, heavy leaders, heavy taper uh, lines. So, you know, look for those lines that are bass specific, streamer specific. But one thing to keep in mind in Texas, it's warm. You know, if you're fishing most of the summertime, those trout lines get too hot. Look for your tropical lines or bass specific lines that are meant for more warmer climates. You're gonna have a better working line for you. For leaders, I fish heavy leaders, 15, 20 pound leaders a lot of times for this bass. And people go, wow, like they break off. It's like, no, the flies are heavy. Once again, it's the fly you're trying to cast. A thicker, heavier leader is gonna turn over flies better. So when you're fishing the poppers, the game changers, and these flies that got a lot going on, you're basically chunking a chicken through the air, having a tapered line, and guys, I tie my own. I usually just go like 40 pounds, 30 pounds, 20 pounds, that's my leader. You know, keep it simple, but heavier leader so it can turn that fly, and leaders that have a thicker butt section. If you're gonna buy leaders from the store, zero X or lower, you know, like that, you know, heavy stuff. Or look for the ones that are like the streamer leaders or those bass leaders. They'll have a thicker butt section to turn over flies or tie your own. 40 pounds, 30 pounds, 20 pounds, you're good. So I do sometimes use sinking lines, especially during the winter time. One quick note on sinking lines. 
If you're trying to get those flights lower with the sinking line, think about what's happening. The line is sinking. If you have a nine foot leader, which is like the standard leader, and you're fishing nine feet of water, your line is gonna sink nine feet, that fly is gonna stay up here. So when I throw sinking lines, especially during, during the winter time, where I'm just trying to get you know, flies to go deeper because I'm fishing areas that are deeper water, I'm using leaders that are like four foot, five foot leaders, if not sometimes shorter. That way that line brings that leader down with it, not a super long leader. Now if you're f f using a floating line, now you might have to use a longer leader if you're trying to get that fly a little bit deeper. But keep that in mind if you're using the sinking lines. Now for flies, guys, I know everyone wants to know what's the secret flies and they want to take photos of the flies I'm going to show you guys. But look, I really break it down to three flies, okay? Stuff on the surface, stuff that swims, and stuff that crawls on the bottom. That's pretty much it. Have fun. Choose the flies you're confident about. All the time, I think you said the other day on the boat, it's like, oh, I don't like the, or I never catch them on a yellow fly. And I was like, we're switching it. You know, use the flies you're confident with, guys. If you're out there and you're using a fly to go, man, this is gonna catch a fish. You're more ready, you're ready to go. But to keep it simple, guys, 75% of all the bass I catch, I'm trying to catch them on poppers. Guess what? They'll come up and eat a popper all the time. I catch them all the time with a crawfish sticking out of their throat and they'll eat a popper. So if you pop that enough and they want to eat it, they'll come up and eat a popper. We were fishing what, like 45 degree weather the other day. They ate poppers entire day. So they'll eat poppers. They're in shallow water, guys. These are river fish. They're not going 30 feet down. Most of our rivers don't even have a spot that's 30 feet deep. A lot of these fish are still gonna hang out in shallow areas. So throwing a popper will work 12 months out of the year here. Once as we go down, I pretty much just have flies that, okay, I got my poppers. I use the Dodo popper quite a bit. Simple popper makes a lot of noise. I use boogle bugs quite a big. I think what makes a boogle bug work so well is just those long rubber legs. And I always tell people, just twitch those legs. This move is slow. You know, once from the poppers, I get down into some diver flies. They're kind of going underneath the surface, your little frog divers, your Delbert divers and things like that. And then I, what I fish, the most other than poppers are my weightless streamers. These are flies that don't have any weight to them. They're gonna sink down maybe a few inches, maybe a foot, just enough for that fish that didn't quite wanna to come to the surface, they'll come for that fly. Now my weightless streamers, I throw a lot of game changers. I wish I can tell you they don't work, don't buy them, they're expensive, but man, they work. You know, I'm sorry to tell you all that, but game changers work. Those flies work really, really well. Work on your casting at like $15 a pop or whatever they're selling them for. You probably don't wanna be losing a bunch of them, but they're great flies. How you not lose a bunch of them? Tie 20 pounds on there. You know, just rip it out of that tree, then you're a little better. <laughs> but weightless streamers, guys, you know, that's my game changers. I tie a bunch of simple, simple um, flies just using rabbit strip. Alvin's got a great video on the fat baby, which is like a two material fly. It's just got nice movement. And I use white, black, olive. Pretty much on most of my flies, black, white, olive, black, white, olive. On the poppers, I throw yellow into the mix because if you've ever seen a big old hexagenia mayfly floating down the river, yellow popper time. Okay, so look for those. When the fish actually look yellow, they're probably eating a ton of those hexagenia mayflies, yellow popper. Guys, if they're not eating out of those three, you're probably fishing a little tougher day, okay? Because I'm usually catching them in that first three category. The last two, you get into my weighted streamers. Everything from like conehead buggers, you know, and different uh, weighted streamers. And then the dredgers. These are your crawfish, your helgramite patterns. These are things that are crawling at the bottom. You go and watch any conventional angler fishing, when they're not eating on top, they're throwing jigs into cover at the very bottom and just doing this. You can do the same thing with the fly rod. If it's shallow enough, you can do it with a floating line. If it's a little deeper, you might need a sinking line. Find a fly that rides hook up. Find a fly that's got a weed guard on it. Let it sink all the way to the bottom. And I, when I say dredging, guys, you're dragging that fly on the bottom. Watch YouTube videos of crawfish on the bottom of a river. See how slow they move. Every once in a while, they'll kind of pulsate. And practice that when you're out there. 
But a lot of times the rest of the year, guys, when we're not finding them on top, they're at the bottom eating crawfish. That's one of the huge staples. Most of the time when I have a fish that I catch and something sticking out of its mouth, it's usually little crawfish antennas. You know, so they eat a ton of them. So don't be afraid. You're gonna lose some flies. You're gonna get hung up. But if these other ones aren't working, dredge a crawfish that might save you the day and that might also bring you that big fish that's down there hanging out. So guys, last couple of things here. Let's talk about a couple of tactics. Some of you folks that fish with me, y'all have heard this over and over. Knock on doors, okay? It's bass fishing. If you look at tournament bass anglers, and I, guys, there's so much information out, uh, out there about bass fishing that's not fly related. The fish don't know what kind of rod you're holding. They just have patterns that they follow. So if you wanna get some information about bass fishing, look up what the conventional guys are doing. There's a ton of information. There's million dollar tournaments out there that apparently you can win with some extra weight in fish or something like that. But you can learn a lot from those tournament guys. I mean, their livelihoods are on those tournaments. And what you're gonna see is they have 10 rods on that boat. They get to a spot, they throw the first rod, they throw the second rod, they throw the rod, and they go to the next spot and they're just knocking on doors looking for fish. So as we're fishing for bass, especially in a river, we're knocking on doors. And I always tell people, fish the future. Look downstream, you threw it there, they said no, keep moving. Just like a door-to-door -door salesman. If anyone here has ever done door-to-door -door sales or cold calling of any kind, the more doors you knock on, the better your chance. I tell clients all the time, fish don't know you're a beginner, they don't know you've been doing this for 10 years. You keep knocking on the door, you might find that person that really wants to buy those knives from you or whatever else you're selling. So knock on doors. So, as we're floating down the river, there's Lene, you know. So if we're floating down a river, guys, we're looking down the river. We're fishing the future. If you're waiting to cast next to the boat where I'm rowing my oars or you're rowing your kayak, that fish is already scared. You're looking down the river. You're looking downstream. That does a couple of things. You're surprising fish better because they're not seeing you. And a surprised fish is a lot more likely to eat also, by throwing it slightly downstream, that current keeps that line straight. If you're gonna notice that if you cast to your side and you don't mend, your line goes here. Well, cast there already. Biggest thing with bass fishing is keeping a straight line. So as we're working down the river, we're knocking on doors. That's a door, that's a door, that's a door, that's a door. Anything that breaks the cycle of the river is an opportunity for a fish to be there. I love points because everything has got to swim around the point. So anytime there's something that sticks out, every little bit of bait, every little grasshopper has to go around this point. If I'm a fish that's going to sit around somewhere and look for an easy meal, I'm going to wait right here. So if this angler here looks up and is casting into the future, you're targeting those fish that are at those ambush points. Knock on door and keep going. And I always tell people all the time, make that first cast count. If you make it, if you wanna hit that tree, but if you don't quite get there, work that fly, see if that fish is there because the surprise, the element of surprise is your biggest thing you have. Now, you can do the same thing if you're wade fishing. If you're wade fishing, I still have people looking downstream. With trout fishing, you're typically looking upstream and that fly is floating down at you and you can kind of hook set by just lifting up. It ain't gonna work with bass, guys. You need that line to be tight. They eat crawfish, they eat snakes and birds and all sorts of things. Their mouths are tough. You're not gonna be able to trout set them. So that line being down river, not only are you surprised, but you're keeping that line tight so you have a better connection. So if you're wade fishing, I always tell people, walk downstream. Where you're usually trout fishing, you walk upstream, walk downstream bass fishing, and just like we're floating down in a boat, you're targeting the edges of the river as you go down. And once again, you're knocking on doors. Around this thing, that's a door. Front of that log, behind that log, that's a door. Keep knocking on doors. You wanna have a productive day with bass fishing? It isn't changing flies 30 times. They're not that picky. It's finding fish that wanna eat. If you don't find them here, keep going, keep walking, keep floating. It's where you can find those fish. So 
Let's get into final last things here, guys, on some technique. And this just kind of comes from having people on my boat and just kind of realizing a lot of the mistakes that anglers are making that keep from being successful. The first thing I tell people is you're gonna have to cast tight. And that means a couple of things. First off, that means tight to structure. So when I say, see that log, see that point, hit that log, hit that point. I tell people all the time, if you're throwing something that looks like a grasshopper, it's coming from the ground into the water. So if you're casting, you're, it's like landing on the grass, perfect. Walk it right in. And I don't know how many times I've seen fish jump out of the water to hit that fly before it ever hits the water. They're there on the edge looking for things to fall in. So cast right on the edge. If you cast a foot off, you might be landing behind that fish and you might never get to him. By the time he turns around, you might have popped it out of his region. So cast tight, get really close. If you're not getting stuck every once in a while, just like nymph fishing, you're not getting into their zone. So if you see a log, if you see anything, we're casting really close. Typically it's really tight to the bank. Sometimes it'd be tight to just a, a stump that's in the middle of the river. Now, also casting tight means keeping it out of the trees. So practice your casting. I tell people all the time, instead of practicing and putting a hula hoop down and you're trying to cast into the hula hoop, stand that hula hoop up and learn how to cast through a hula hoop because that's what you need to get to these fish. So easy way to practice this, next time you get a big box, hold on to it, set it out in your yard and see if you can land that fly inside the box because that's gonna help you practice when you have those overhanging trees, overhanging branches. You're gonna see a bunch of flies and lures stuck up on the tree. That fish is back there, you know, and if you can get back there where most people can't make that cast, you're gonna get to that fish. So practice your sidearm casting and practice casting into things. Go out to a park and practice casting to the bottom of the trees with a fake fly. That way you're practicing staying out. Overhead casting, you're gonna get stuck on things. Sidearm, keeping it tight. Cast ahead, look into the future. How many times did we see a fish come up and eat before we get to it? I tell people all the time, look down river as we're floating down, you're in your kayak. I go, oh, there's one right there. And that's my favorite thing, when they give themselves away and you go, let's go teach that fish a lesson. He's right there, he's eating. So look down river, focus down the river, not next to you, down the river you can surprise those fish. When you're fishing, tips are down. So we have tips down, line straight. I always tell people, eliminate any kind of bend in that line. So that tip is almost in the water, that line is straight, and you're pointing to that popper, that streamer. That way when that fish bites, we're trying to strip set those fish. And a lot of times where people make the mistake with strip settings, they have so much slack in the system because the tip's over here, the fly's over here, the rod is up, and when they, they, a fish bites, they're going, uh, 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 and they go, oh, I didn't hook them. And I was like, you did nothing. Those five strips did absolutely nothing because there's all this slack. Stay tight, tip down, point at it. When that fish eats, a lot of times you just holding that line is gonna hook that fish if you don't have any slack in it. Change your retreat before you change your fly, guys. A lot of times they're not so picky so much on the fly. Maybe you're moving it too fast. Cold day, they're cold blooded. They're gonna move slower. Warmer day, they're gonna move faster. So if you working a fly a certain way, you're not getting bites, change it up, slow down your retrieve, speed up your retrieve, you know, change your retrieve before you change your fly. Now, once you hook a fish, strip fish in quickly. We don't put bass on the reel. If you put a bass on the reel, you're probably gonna lose that bass. If you're going, I need to put them on the reel to protect the tippet, you're using too light of tippet. So if you're using 15 or 20 pounds and you hook that five pounder, that first thing that fish is gonna to try to do is run you right back into where he came from. If he runs in there, game is over. He's gonna break you off. So your job is when you hook a fish in the lily pads and a bunch of you know, stumps and rocks, whatever, you're stripping that fish in as fast as you can. Once again, watch bass fishing videos, conventional guys. They hook a fish, that rod is up, and they're reeling as fast. That fish is dragging across all those lily pads and everything else because if you give them a chance, they're gonna come off. I've had so many fish that as soon as I scoop them, that flies out of their mouth. He was never actually hooked. By you stripping fast and keeping that pressure on, meaning that if he's swimming that way, I'm pulling a little bit to the right. If he's swimming that way, I'm pulling a little bit to the left, and I'm just trying to get that fish in as quickly as possible. 
We're not letting these fish run. We're not putting them on the reel. We're keeping opposite pressure. Now the final thing, guys, I know we live in Texas. I know a lot of us bass fish our whole life and things like that. And I think bass a lot of times gets a kind of a bad you know, reputation. Well, I guess a good reputation is bad for them that we think they're like, oh, they're not like trout. You can leave them out of the water. You can let them on the bottom of your boat. You know, we can do whatever with them. They're still fish, guys. You know, they're out of the water. They're not breathing, okay? So I always tell people, keep them wet just like you treat every other fish. You know, watch for the sunscreen on your hand. Those kinds of things still matter. You know, and then for the, especially the bigger fish that fought hard, revive them, make sure they're strong enough to swim back. You know, the same way, it's funny because you get people that will, you know, get, you know, go trout fish, all of a sudden their mentality changes. Oh, this fish is precious. You know, I'm like, this is a stock fish that came out of a truck. This is a wild Texas fish native right here. Take care of this guy right here. So, you know, handle all these fish with care. They deserve it. So guys, I'll take a couple of final questions here, but one thing I just want to reiterate, that's a red eye one right there. Uh, one thing I wanted to kind of, you know, say again is that these are a wild native fish. People travel here from other parts of the world to catch a Guadalupe bass. You know, bass fishing has gotten really popular in Japan. There's people coming from Japan to chase certain species of bass that you can only find around the United States. We have something that's really special here. When you go to other states, they have largemouth. They got them there, they got smallmouth, they got them there. This is the only place, you guys are in the only place that these fish can be caught and something for y'all to be, take a lot of pride in. And once again, it was a fish that was almost forgotten about, that if it wasn't for that classroom of little third graders that made it a state fish, a lot of attention to this fish wouldn't have been received and we might have lost them altogether. So when you're out there fishing, now they know how to identify them, you know, now you know what you're catching. You know, be really proud that you're holding a true Texas native, a fish that's been here for thousands and thousands of years and have called this place home long before any of us were ever here. So as long as these fish are doing well, that means that we're taking care of our, 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 our land, our Texas here. So if these fish are struggling, that means that we're not doing right by the resource that we have. So thank you guys so much. Thank you all for sticking around. I know there's a party going on out there. And if there's any questions or anything, I'm here to take them. And I'm just gonna start throwing stuff out there because I was told just to give stuff away. <laughs> Double X, anyone got a big friend? There you go.